Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. Today I'm going to continue with my updated series of lessons about the Old Norse language for people learning or reviewing that language. In this video, what I'm going to look at are principally the endings of strong adjectives. Adjectives come in a strong and a weak form, and I really just want to look at the strong form in this video. And the reason I want to do that and then also look at some of the personal pronouns and the article is that the third person personal pronouns and the article, the word for the, use forms of the same endings as the strong adjectives. So they're useful to learn altogether rather than feeling like you're learning uh, three different sets of endings because they really are, in essence, uh, just one set. The previous videos in this collection, which are all gathered into a playlist on my YouTube channel. I include an overview about Old Norse pronunciation as reconstructed, also modern Icelandic pronunciation for people who prefer that. There's one about the basics of nouns, one about the basics of verbs, and one about sound change. I'll refer to those and uh, you can find those videos also on my channel in this playlist. Note that in none of these videos have I intended to present every single possible detail about the subject. I really just want to introduce them in a way that makes sense for someone who is trying to learn the language probably from scratch. All right, so adjectives. If you haven't learned Old Norse or a similar language uh, with inflection before, or if you haven't looked at my nouns video, I recommend that you do that because with adjectives, we have to consider the same cases as with nouns, nominative, accusative, genitive, and dative. Since I have limited room on this little board and the screen, I am just abbreviating those as N-A-G-D, nominative, accusative, genitive, dative, in this video. And I'm writing them in the order that I usually do. Keep in mind, some people will write those in different orders, so you have to be sure that you, if you're looking at, if you're, if you're using multiple different sources by multiple different people, make sure that um, you're clear about what order everybody's presenting the cases in. So adjectives have gender, just like nouns do. They have case, just like nouns do. And they have number, just like nouns do. But in the case of adjectives, these things don't depend on the adjective itself. They depend on the noun or the pronoun that the adjective is describing. So for instance, if I want to say that a a fierce Viking is raiding the shoreline. The adjective fierce is going to be nominative because Viking is nominative, it's the subject of the verb. It's going to be masculine because Viking is masculine. And it's going to be singular because I'm talking about one Viking, not multiple Vikings. But then if I saw fierce Valkyries, the adjective fierce is going to be accusative because Valkyries is accusative. I saw them. What did I see? I saw the Valkyries, so they're the object. It's going to be feminine because Valkyries are feminine, and it's going to be plural because I'm talking about multiple Valkyries, not just one. So each adjective has to be able to adjust to all the different cases, numbers, and genders that it can be to describe any given noun. The nice thing is, whereas nouns come in several different inflections, uh, there are many different ways that the uh, noun endings can be added to the nouns. You have, for instance, the, the basic A stems, which were viewed in the basic nouns video. Uh, but there's also I stems, there's U stems, there's constant stems, there's R stem, family nouns, there's weak nouns. The adjectives all share the same set of endings. right? So that's actually pretty nice. So let's take a look at what these endings are first without looking at them on uh, an example word. You'll notice, and here I've used, as I usually do, uh, the old-fashioned astrological uh, masculine and feminine signs for masculine and feminine, and then just an X for neuter. Notice that these are not too different from the corresponding endings of uh, the basic strong noun types of each gender. They're not identical, but they're similar enough to help. So, for instance, in the masculine, you'll see R in the nominative singular, S in the genitive singular. This is just like a typical masculine noun. But unlike a typical masculine noun, we do have an ending in the accusative on, and then the dative ending, the singular masculine, is um, which looks like a dative plural ending, of course, if we're just used to nouns. So we have to watch for that. Another thing to watch for 
is that the nominative plural of masculine adjectives ends in IR, but the nominative accusative plural of feminine adjectives ends in AR. Why is this something we need to watch for? Because masculine nouns in the nominative plural typically end in AR, and feminine nouns in the nominative accusative plural typically end in IR. So this is the reverse of the typical situation with nouns. All right, so this is something that can't be overstated. This can really trip people up. We talk about storier vikingar, right? Big Vikings, uh, nominative plural masculine, but storar valkyrior, big Valkyries, or to use something that has an IR in the plural, uh, storar sakir, big things, big matters in the feminine. So the adjective in the plural and the noun that it goes with in the plural probably won't have the same ending. They can. There are feminine nouns that have AR in the plural, masculine nouns that have IR in the plural, but that's not the typical default uh, type of masculine or feminine noun. Then notice, like in masculine uh, typical nouns, the accusative plural ending is A. And then in the genitive and dative plural for all three genders, the endings are the same, just like they are uh, in nouns. Uh, same dative plural ending as in nouns, which is um. So notice the masculine dative singular and dative plural have the same ending. And then notice in the genitive plural, they all end in ra. That r is in addition to the a that we're used to seeing there in nouns. In the feminine, there is no ending in the singular nominative. However, there is u umlaut there because there used to be a u. So anywhere that a uh, adjective has the vowel a, the sound a, in its root, it is going to be affected by u umlaut or u mutation. And the same in the neuter, nominative plural, and accusative plural, where there used to be a u that's no longer there, but it still causes u umlaut. Notice this is not too different from in nouns, where we expect u umlaut on strong feminine nouns in the singular and on strong neuter nouns in the plural. However, there are uh, a, a, a richer set of endings in the feminine singular for adjectives than for most feminine nouns. A, singular accusative, rar, genitive, singular, and ri, dative, singular. And then I've talked about these. In the neuter, the singular nominative and accusative both end in T. The genitive singular S is the same as for masculine adjectives and also the same as for typical neuter nouns. And then we have U. Uh, not um, but just u in the um, dative singular for neuters. And then no ending, like I said, in the plural, nominative, and accusative for neuters, just like in nouns, but there is u umlaut if the root of the adjective uh, has the letter a, the sound a in it, it will be u umlauted. So now let's take a look at an example of an actual adjective of uh, adding these endings to it. All right, so here is the adjective sterker a common adjective for strong in all of its strong adjectival forms. Notice that like nouns, when you look up adjectives in the dictionary, the form they'll be listed in is the nominative singular, and since adjectives can be any of three genders, it will be in the nominative singular masculine. So if you have a dictionary that, uh, or a glossary that shows you English to Old Norse, Old Icelandic forms, you will see strong sterker. That does not mean, of course, that sterker is the form that adjective is going to take all the time, because that's just its masculine nominative singular form. These are the rest of its forms of, well, the rest of the forms of its strong endings. So, for instance, if a strong man is here, I would say sterker madr. A strong woman is here, sterk kona. A strong ship, sterkt skip. I'm changing it each time to agree with a gender of the noun that it's referring to. Similarly, I saw a strong man, sterkan man, accusative. This is a strong man's sword, sterks mans sferd. I gave a strong man a, a, a tax, sterkum mani, dative. Strong men fight, sterkir men, nominative plural. I fought strong men, sterka men, accusative plural. Uh, this is a strong men's game, sterkra mana, genitive plural. 
I gave strong men an attack, stercum monum, dative plural. Similarly, uh, each one of these would be used with a woman, just for convenience, using a, another feminine, another uh, human noun for the, the uh, obvious gender. So a strong woman is here, stercona, I saw a strong woman, sterca, konu. Uh, this is a strong woman's words, uh, sterk, rar, konu. Uh, I gave a strong woman attacks, sterkri, konu. Strong women are fighting, sterkar, konur. Uh, I fought strong women, sterkar, konur. This is a, this is, this is, this is a strong women's game, sterkra, kvena, gin of plural. I gave strong women an attack, sterkum, konum. A strong ship is here, sterkt, skip. A straw, I saw a strong ship, sterkt, skip. This is a strong ship's sail, sterk skips, jindu. Uh, I gave a strong ship a, a cargo, sterku skippy. Strong ships are sailing, sterk skip, no ending because this is neuter. I saw strong ships, sterk skip, accused of plural. This is, I don't know, a, a cargo of strong ships, sterk skipa. I gave strong ships an attack, sterkum skipum. The only reason I go through all these examples is just to remind you that any time that a noun or adjective is actually being used in a sentence, you have to consider the case, and that case is going to affect both the noun and the adjective, and then the form the adjective takes is going to be affected by the gender of the noun. So take any given adjective, look it up in a glossary or dictionary, you're going to find the masculine noun of singular form, and then you just knock that R off and plug the other endings onto the end. Let's take a look at another example. All right, this is the uh, adjective hager, which is crafty, intelligent, clever. When you look it up in the dictionary, you'll find hager, and you'll notice that all of the endings are exactly the same as for sterker. In fact, I've just erased the root sterk and written hag there. But whenever an ending has u in it, or used to have u in it, like the feminine nominative singular or the neuter nominative and accusative plural, you're going to have u umlaut. In other words, that a is going to turn into a hook o. Hogum, not hagum. Hog, not hog. Hogu, not hagu. Hogum, not hagum. I think I said that. And then hog, not hog. A simpler way to remember that, if you don't care to remember that there used to be a u there, is just if an adjective has a u in the ending or it has no ending, you're going to get u umlaut if the root vowel is an A. All right, let's look at a couple more examples of interesting phenomena with adjectives. All right, this is just one more example of an adjective that has a ah in the root, and so it has u umlaut of the root where there is a u in the ending or no ending. This is spakr, which means wise. There are a lot of words in Old Norse that mean wise, uh, and this is just one of them. So notice, once again, exact same endings as sterker, exact same endings as hager, and like hager, because we have an a ah in the root, that all turns into hook o, the open o, rounded sound o, when there is a u in the ending or no ending. This is the adjective fimmer now. Uh, fimmer is agile, dexterous, nimble. Notice, once again, just to drive this point home, this adjective does not have the letter a, the sound a in its root, so it has the exact same endings as sterker, hager, and spacher, but there is no u umlaut whatsoever. So the nominative singular feminine is just fin, as is the neuter nominative and accusative plural. Don't overanalyze it. Don't get too used to the ones that have u umlaut. They are kind of a minority. Uh, and, and try to do something to the adjectives that don't have that one vowel, the letter A, and their root. All right, uh, now I'll move on. Now, one thing you have to watch for is that in some adjectives, there is an R at the end of the root. So the R is actually part of the core of the word and not just of the masculine singular ending. One example of that is fagr, which is cognate with the English word fair. Often you can recognize one of these words that has an R in the root that's not just part of the ending because the English cognate will have an R at the end too. And so fagr, fair, of course, in the sense of beautiful, this is one of the typical Old Norse words for beautiful. 
Uh, notice that here, that R stays in every ending. The other endings are added to it because it's part of the core of the word. So let's look at how one of these works. Notice that in the masculine nominative singular, we don't add a second R at the end, unlike with the other adjectives, because Old Norse is highly resistant to ever having three consonants in a row, especially if two of them are the same consonant. And so since this would get us three consonants in a row, two of them would be the same, one of them would, you know, there'd be two R's, uh, it's simply not added at all. And so Fager is the masculine nominative singular. And then instead of knocking that R off, we add all the endings to the core with an R. And so otherwise it's pretty normal, right? Uh, if you just keep in mind that the R is, is part of the root. Notice then in the feminine, we still have the R. We just have the U umlauted root because of course there used to be a U in this ending and the same thing in the nominative and accusative plural of neuters. There are also other adjectives that uh, work like this but don't have U umlaut. Stor is a big one. That's of course just big, but notice that in the case of stor, the masculine nominative singular does have a second R because there's no danger of getting three constants run together and then the feminine nominative singular will just have stor with one R, All right? So that'll be a little bit different from uh, the example of Hagar. All right, let's look at another phenomenon. All right, in Old Norse, R in an ending has a tendency to assimilate to an L or an N in the root of a word. That is, if you have an R from an ending that touches an L or an N at the end of the root, typically that R is gonna turn into an L or an N. So here's an example of an R turning into an L. Notice how many adjective endings start with R or consist entirely of R. So gamal means old. The root then is gamal ending in this one L. What's happened here is that once you look up in the dictionary, the masculine nominative singular form has that R, the masculine nominative singular, assimilated to the L at the end of the root. So this is gamal with two L's. The pronunciation of this must have been different in Old Norse because it is consistently reflected there and it has a different outcome in modern Icelandic. Wherever there's a double L in modern Icelandic, it's pronounced as a TL, so gamal. The difference between the double L and the single L in Old Norse is a little bit harder to, uh, to, to decipher. Perhaps the L, when it was spelled double, was just held longer, gamal, something of that nature. Notice here that we add the normal endings, but since this is a two-syllable root, any time that the ending adds a syllable, we're going to drop the second vowel as long as the result does not bring three constants together. If it brings two constants together, that's fine. So here we're going to drop that A, that middle vowel, because the ending adds a third vowel, third syllable. So we get gamlan, not Gamalon. This is a very common tendency of Old Norse. Old Norse wants to be trochaic. It wants words to be stressed, unstressed, two-syllable words. Here we have gamals, what we'd expect. Gomlum, again, that second syllable lost in you umlaut. Gamlir, gamla, second syllable lost. But here in the genitive plural, we have gamala, second syllables retained, because if we drop that A, we'd have three syllables come together, M-L-L, and we don't want that. Remember the example of Fagr, where we have only one R, not two, after that G. Then to Gomlum, uh, two syllables, second one drops because it doesn't bring three constants together. In the feminine nominative singular, notice we have Gomul. This is because the, of the U umlaut chain reaction, where if an ending uh, has or had a U, the, and there's two A's in the root, the first one turns into Huko, and the second one, the unstressed one, turns into another U. And notice this also affects the neuter nominative and accusative plural, Gomul. The feminine nominative singular and the neuter nominative and accusative plural are always the same with the adjectives. And then we have gamla, drop in that second vowel, but gamala or gamali, where we don't, but notice that we have this r, rar, ri, that turns into an l because it's next to the l in the root. Then gamla, 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 gomlum, like we'd expect. In the neuter, also gamalt, gamalt, gamals, gomlu, with your typical endings. All right, now this also happens with n, so let's take an example of an adjective where this happens within, let's look at threken. All right, now there are many adjectives where the root ends in an N and the R's of the adjectival endings have assimilated to that N and become N's, much like the R's assimilate to L's and become 
L's and contact with L's oftentimes. So here is the adjective threken, tough, enduring. Notice that where there is an R in your typical set of endings, that's assimilating, become an N next to this N. The on of your typical adjective ending has been reduced to simply an N added to the root. S added to the root, your typical ending. Um added to the root, your typical ending. Notice these aren't affected because they don't start with an R. But also notice that the root here, uh, like with gamal, loses its second syllable when you add this third syllable, as long as losing the second syllable, you don't get uh, three consonants in a row. As long as there's just two consonants that are left in a row, it's fine. You can drop that second syllable because Old Norse prefer, prefers trochies, stressed syllable, unstressed syllable, threk, num, to something like threk and num. Same thing here, reduce two syllables, threk near, threk na, threk in na, back to three syllables because this would bring uh, three consonants together if we drop that second vowel. And then also here, what the normal ending is, ra starts with an r, that r assimilates to the n and becomes an n. And then here we're back to our normal ending, but two syllables. Here, there's no a to mutate by u mutation, so it's just the bare root, threken. Threkna, reduced to two syllables. Threkna, we're back to three syllables because we can't have three consonants come together. Uh, and notice that this ending normally starts with an r but that R assimilates to the N in contact with the N at the end of the root. Same thing here, threken ni, not threken ri. And then here, threkna, threkna, exactly what we'd expect, and then threkna, threknum, just like the masculine genitive and dative plural. The neuters of these types have an ending you might not expect. It's just IT, threket. This comes from an earlier threkent, uh, although that stage is not attested if it is, it's in some random rooting inscription that I can't think of right now. It's definitely not tested in any of our literary period old Norse. So threk it, threk it, and then threkens, like you'd expect, just like the masculine genitive singular, threk new, reduced to two syllables, threken, threken, with just the root, no ending because there's no a to mutate, and then threken, not threk new, just like the masculine and feminine genitive and dative plurals. And so these endings where that R has assimilated to an N at the end are identical with the endings of the article, the word for the, which you can think of as a sort of adjective. So let's look at that next. And uh, before we move on, let me point out to you that whether or not you wanted to, you have now done the uh, six core D&D &D attributes in Old Norse, strength, sterker, uh, wisdom, spakar, intelligence, hager, dexterity, femur, uh, charisma, fager, and uh, constitution, threken. All right, this is the definite article, the word the in Old Norse. It is basically an adjective with the root in, I, in, and then your typical adjective endings, but those typical adjective endings, like with threken, are assimilated the R's in the endings assimilate to the N in the root. So you have in masculine nominative singular instead of inner. Notice too, like with adjectives like threken, you have just a single N here, not inon. And you have, again, the R assimilated to an N in genitive plural, R assimilated to N in the feminine genitive and dative singular. And you have this T ending here instead of I nt, like with threket, threket. Now typically, the definite article, the word the in Old Norse, like in the modern Scandinavian languages, is not used separately from a noun. It is typically used as a suffix on the noun, and I'll look at examples of this in just a moment. But you do sometimes see it used separately, and when it's used separately, that's typically because a noun is being used together with an adjective that is being used to characterize it. So for instance, Eriker in Raudi, Eric the Red, right? Notice that the adjective there, Raudi Red, is a weak adjective, and we'll get to weak adjectives in a future video. Similarly, in the names of some of the poems uh, that get included in the poetic Edda, Sigurdarkvida in Skama, Sigurd 
Sayer's poem, The Short, The Short One, or Voluspa and Skama, Voluspa, The Short. In many manuscripts, this I-N is written E-N, and I often write it that way in reproducing Old Norse because I'm so used to seeing it in manuscripts that way. But in your typical uh, editions of Old Norse text, it'll be written with an I, so it's probably better to learn it that way. But be watchful for forms of this that have an E. The E forms, so an, an, ans, anum, etc., are especially common when the adjective is separate like this, as opposed to one that's acting like a suffix on a noun. But now let's add these two nouns as suffixes the way that we typically see the definite article in Old Norse. Now typically this is what Old Norse nouns look like when you add the to them, the definite article. So elder, typical masculine noun is fire, but eldrin is the fire. Notice that when you add this suffix the, almost certainly this r would have been would have been pronounced with the second syllable, making it a two-syllable, not a three-syllable word. Eldrin, rather than eldrin. Uh, in modern Icelandic, it is three syllables. Eldurin, though. Now, notice that the way that I've written this, I have a little dot between the noun and the article, and a bit of space, so that, uh, well, for one thing, so I don't have to erase this and rewrite it, but also so that you can see clearly the boundary. But these are written in Old Norse as one word. Eldrin, elden, etc. So notice, first of all, if you looked at the noun video or you know your Old Norse noun endings, that the nouns look the same as they normally do, right? We have all the normal endings on these nouns. They are fully inflected, except for the dative plural, where the M at the end of the noun will drop off. So you get just eldu, yorthu, skipu, instead of yorthum, eldum, skipum. And then notice that the article also looks the same as it does when it's separate from the noun, except that it loses the I at the beginning, I've represented this as a dash, if the uh, form of the noun ends in a vowel, or in M, or if it is the R of the nominative accusative plural. So you get El dinum with one eye, not el dinum with two eyes. You get el darnir, not el darinir, etc. The eye drops out after a vowel or after the R of the nominative accusative plural or after the M of the dative plural. So notice again, it's good to learn this as just an extension of the adjective endings because this is just an adjective with the root in, basically. Uh, and the assimilations of R to N that you see in other adjectives like threken. In fact, the origin of this article, uh, it is probably related to the English word yawn. So this is an origin, something like saying yawn fire, or since it's a suffix fire yawn. Although, of course, this is developed into uh, just a basic article in uh, Old Norse. And then into the modern Scandinavian languages too. Uh, Icelandic, Faroese, Norwegian, Swedish, Danish all use an article descended from this uh, and use a post post suffixed article, so that in the modern Scandinavian languages today, as opposed to English where you say the man, and in Norwegian you say manin. So this is, uh, again, good to know. Every noun works this way when you add the definite article to it. So regardless of the type of noun, if you're dealing with a strong masculine noun, a weak masculine noun, um, I stem and you stem, whatever, the article is always the same. And, of course, it will or will not drop this I, depending on whether the, the form of the noun has a vowel at the end. But the actual form that the, that the article takes is consistent across all noun types. Okay, having looked at that for reference, let's look at one more place where these basic adjective endings uh, crop up in Old Norse. Now, in these boxes, I've written han and hon he and she. Notice that these pronouns have endings that work on the exact same pattern as the definite article or an adjective. He, nominative singer, is han, accusative han, genitive hans, dative honum, exactly like the endings of the definite article. And then she, hon, hana, henar, heni, exactly like the endings of the article in Inna, inna, inni. So it's not something you have to learn separately when you learn the personal pronouns. So of course these personal pronouns are uh, equivalent to English he, him, his, and then to him, she, her, 
her possessive, like her book, and then to her. The other third person pronouns, uh, the forms for it and they are not formed uh, to these endings uh, or with the same root as uh, Han and Hon, uh, but for completion's sake, let's look at them now too. All right, this is the complete set of third person personal pronouns. So we have he, him, his, she, her, her, and then here we have it, its. So notice as usual, uh, the nominative singular and accusative singular of a neuter are the same, just thought, thought. The genitive singular is thes, this would be equivalent to English its without an apostrophe, and thi, to it. Then in the plural of each of these, notice that there is a different way of saying they, them, if it's masculine, feminine, or neuter. So masculine nominative plural they is ther, accusative plural tho, and then genitive and dative plural thera, them, which is the same for all of them. Notice how genitive and dative plurals tend to be identical for all genders of a given class of words. The feminine nominative accusative, they, them, thar, thar, and the neuter nominative and accusative, thou, thou, as usual, nominative and accusative are the same in a given number for the neuter. Now, keep in mind, of course, that Old Norse is a gendered language, as we discussed in the video about nouns. So something will be called he or she or it, or well, han, hon, thought, depending not on its actual literal sex, but depending on its grammatical gender. So book is feminine, so if you talk about a book, it's hon, right? But a child is neuter, so if you talk about a child, that's thought. But a, uh, a long ship is masculine, so if you talk about that, it's han. And similarly, if you're talking about groups of things, you're going to use the correct they, them words, depending on what gender it is. So if I'm talking about my books and I say they are great, I'm going to be using that because book is feminine. So multiple books, I'm going to use the feminine third person plural. Or if I'm talking about multiple long ships, I'm going to talk about them in the masculine, there. If there is a mix of different genders, if you have, if you're talking about a they, whether humans or just words that have different grammatical genders, that have mixed gender, you use thou, use the neuter in Old Norse. Of course, this is different from French or Spanish, where if you have uh, one masculine referent and 99 feminine reference, you're going to use the masculine. In Old Norse, if you have any mixture of genders, you're going to use the neuter by default. Notice also, uh, as just a fun historical aside, that the English words they, their, and them come from the Old Norse masculine forms. This is a rare instance of borrowing of basic pronouns uh, between two languages, but of course Old Norse and Old English are closer related, and uh, part of the subconscious motivation behind the borrowing may have been that the Old English equivalents of these pronouns were easily confused with the Old English forms of uh, he, him, and her. Since we're looking at the third person personal pronouns, since I've given you that chart, let's also take a moment to look at the chart for the first and second person personal pronouns, uh, I and you. These are the forms of the first and second person personal pronouns, I and you. Notice that the personal pronouns are one aspect of English grammar where we still have cases, right? We still distinguish an a nominative, I, from an accusative dative, me, from a genitive, my, or mine. And the Old Norse forms of these pronouns closely mirror the forms of their English cognates. Ek, I, mik, me, mean, mine, mer, to me, or me is the object of certain prepositions. Notice that these, these of course, are Old West Norse forms because that's where most of our literature is written, but in Old East Norse, the typical form of ek is yak which has the breaking sound change that I discussed in my sound change video. That's why you have modern Swedish ja, uh, modern Danish ja, Eastern Norwegian also ja, ja, because of breaking. In the plural, we have we, ver, accusative and dative os, just like English us, and genitive vor, our. In Old East Norse, this has a long i, usually, vir, which is where Swedish, Danish, East Norwegian V comes from. In the first and second person personal pronouns, the 
this is the only part of the Old Norse language where any trace of the dual category is left over. In the Gothic language, the earliest Germanic language for which we have extensive records, there is a full dual category, so verbs have a different dual, uh, have different dual endings too, at least in the first and second person. Uh, but in Old Norse, this only survives as a form of the first and second personal pronouns. So what the dual is, is this is we if it's just two people. This is we if it includes more than two people. So if I'm just talking about me and one other person, you know, we are going, then I would say vit. But if I'm talking about multiple people beyond two, then it's ver. And then similarly, us for two people, us two, okar, and our two, okar. The forms of the second person closely mirror those of the first person. Thu is you, singular. I'm talking about one person. Of course, this is older English, thou. And then you as the object, thick, or indirect object, ther. And then genitive, thin, much like English, thine. Of course, in uh, almost all dialects of present-day English, these are all forms thu, thick, ther are all replaced by just you, right? Uh, which originally is the... Uh, accusative data plural form in English. So we're not used to making a distinction between subject and object forms of you. You know, we're used to, I went to the rodeo, but uh, he wants to kill me. But we also say, you know, without case distinction, you went to the rodeo, he wants to kill you. In Old Norse, we have to make that distinction between subject, you went to the rodeo, thu, he wants to kill you, thick. And the same thing in the plural. Of course, in standard present-day English, there is no separate plural for you. It's just you, meaning one person, you, meaning plural people. But in Old Norse, like in most Indo-European languages, there is a separate plural. Sometimes you can translate this in English as uh, y'all. Of course, a lot of modern American English dialects use y'all or use you guys or something like that. Uh, if it helps you to translate it that way, use it. You know, it helps you keep the distinction there. The earliest form of the subject uh, form, the nominative plural, you plural, is er, but after 1200 this becomes ther. What's happened is that the er from the ending of the second person plural verb has crept onto the beginning of the second person uh, pronoun, becoming a thorn there. And the same thing happens in the dual where it's it's earlier and then after about 1200 it becomes the. And then we have accusative and dative plural either. Uh, you object, I see you, y'all, and then idvar, your, your all, y'all's uh, possessive uh, plural you. And like in the first person, we have a special form for you, to, it's it, later thit, and then the object forms, accusative dative is iker, and the genitive plural, ikar, or genitive dual, ikar, uh, your two belonging to you too. Old Norse is very strict about maintaining the distinction between dual and plural here, so you won't see someone talking about uh, two people without using vit or thit. Uh, interestingly though, in Icelandic and in uh, many dialects of Western Norwegian, uh, among other dialects in Scandinavia here and there, it's actually the duals that become the modern day plurals. So in modern day Icelandic, Vid and thid actually mean we and, and you, plural y'all, uh, and not just a dual, they become the normal plurals. So uh, a curious fact of language history. All right, well, I hope this has been somewhat useful to those of you who are interested in learning more about Old Norse. I hope this uh, at least function as a uh, refresher or as a uh, reference resource for you. I will remind you that I make these videos for free, but I do have a Patreon page where if you donate as little as a dollar a month, you get the ability to ask me for translations and some other bonuses. And one of those bonuses is, of course, that you can ask me for some help with your, uh, your process of learning Old Norse if you want a little bit of homework or you want me to look at some small translation you tried to do or something like that. So consider that and uh, check out my other videos and the playlist about Old Norse. And for now, I will wish you all the best.